On the outskirts of Delhi, New York, traveling east on State Highway Number 10, you will discover what is known today as the Frisbee House. Gideon Frisbee, a Revolutionary War veteran, settled in Delaware County in 1788 and quickly became a prominent member of the burgeoning community. His home, built in 1797, soon became the center for community gatherings and an inn and tavern for weary travelers. For nearly 200 years, members of the Frisbee family lived and died in the house. Many believe some refused to leave. Visitors and staff have reported hearing strange noises and have encountered an unsettling sensation as if they are being watched by an unseen entity. People feel really eerie in the back part of the house, the addition that was put on later, the nursery and the little girl's bedroom area. The nursery is usually the one that people avoid. And we have people that went up into the nursery and they are up in there for only a couple minutes and they leave and they say they feel a presence. They don't want to continue to work up there. They'd rather work in any room but the house. The Frisbee house is no stranger to tragedy. In 1804, Gideon Frisbee's first wife, Hulda, died in the house, leaving behind her husband and their six children. Five years later, Gideon and his second wife, Free Love, were shattered by the death of their two-month-old son, George. There's a chair in the nursery that was probably where um, someone sat to rock a baby. And I was leading a tour a few weeks ago and there was a young boy staring very intently at it. And I said to him, what, what are you looking at? Is there something that's catching your attention? And he said, yeah, the ghost sitting in that chair. And I looked over there and there was nothing in the chair and that scared everybody in the room. Does the spirit of Hulda Frisbee still patrol her children's bedrooms? And does baby George continue to occupy the room where his life ended so prematurely? Or are the creaks and strains the normal settlings of a 200-year-old house? Courageous travelers can judge for themselves. On October 25th, a special series of Twilight Lantern tours will be offered at the Frisbee House between 5 and 6.30 p.m. The usual expectation about orbs is that they're going to appear in a photo when you least expect it. You think you're just taking a picture of your family, but actually you're getting an unexpected image of the spirit of what appears to be Great Aunt Martha, who had died exactly a year ago that day. There's one very good story about the Drover's Inn in Vestal, which is one of the earliest buildings that survives. And uh, there have been some Civil War reenactors who have gone to the Drover's Inn because it's such an old building. One of the best stories I got about that reenactment is that when some, some of the people were gathering on the porch to take a group photograph, when they looked at the photograph they had taken, they saw in the picture several soldiers who had not been present. They were act actual Civil War soldiers who came into the picture just to play a bit of a joke. To me, it's one of the strangest and most difficult to explain here at the house. Uh, it's told by a fellow who was a restorer here at the house for many years, and he typically worked alone. And one day, as he's closing up late in the afternoon, he turns off his radio. And then over the same radio, he hears what sounds like an old airplane. And then an SOS. And then static. And what makes that story particularly eerie is the fact that the family lost two children in airplane crashes in World War II. We've been hearing local ghost lore since 1977 when I arrived here. And at that point, I, as, I, as I still do now, I asked my students to collect local legends. Some of them collected stories from their grandparents, old stories from the area. I think the ghost lore of this part of upstate New York is heavily influenced by 
some of the historic events that have happened, including the Sullivan-Clinton campaign of 1779, which George Washington organized. I particularly enjoy some of the stories that commemorate historic battles and also give us a sense of the history of the indigenous people of this area. Uh, just at Robertson Center alone, for example, there are personal experience reports of sightings of both Revolutionary War and Civil War soldiers, and also not of a sighting, but hearing uh, a woman, a female ghost, a Mohawk, Mohawk woman singing to her baby very softly. Heading west through the sleepy suburbs of Elmira, New York, a series of Gothic structures loom over the surrounding community. Founded in 1855, Elmira College was the first institution in the world to grant degrees to women equal to those of men, and became known as the mother of women's colleges. Every autumn, as students return, and the nights become longer and colder, they share their encounters with the unexplained in hush whispers. The imposing structure of Tompkins Hall, an all-female dorm built in 1926, is the epicenter of many strange tales told and retold on campus. I've lived on the fourth floor since this last spring, and uh, Tompkins is notorious for being haunted. The rooms in the building, are you kind of walk in and you get a, a creepy vibe to them. You look down the corridor of the hallway and it's like out of a horror movie, um, all, all the floors like creak and I've also talked to many of my residents who hear voices in the hallway or when they're up studying late at night or sleeping, they'll hear strange noises. And there's reportedly a ghost named Mary living on the fourth floor who used to be a student here and died in the building in like a tragic accident. And so a lot of people have experienced her or believe that it's her who's haunting her, them on the floor. Mary is said to appear in mirrors, and this may happen especially late at night when students are all alone. They just happen to glance into a mirror, maybe out of the corner of their eyes. They may see the ghost of Mary hovering there. But she's not just a troublemaking ghost, she's also a very positive, helpful presence. And students say that if they need some help, they may just call on Mary and she'll come and, and try to help them out and make them feel not alone when they're under stress from studying. Does the ghost of Mary still haunt the hallways of her former dorm? Or are these stories merely the product of nervous students and their overactive imaginations? Brave souls in search of the answer can wander among the historic buildings at Elmira College for themselves. Perhaps, though, it might be better not to go alone. Situated at the confluence of two rivers, where Native Americans once camped and revolutionary armies traversed, the land surrounding this commanding structure on Front Street in Binghamton has witnessed many important events. Built in 1904 by Alonzo Robertson, a local lumber merchant, and his wife, Margaret, the mansion contained a multitude of modern conveniences. It was a very philanthropic family. They, they gave their mansion a large amount of money for the foundation of uh, an education center, and it made a big difference for the community. Today, many visitors and staff report hearing strange noises and experiencing events beyond explanation. So we have a lot of guests over the years who, after visits in the mansion, will say that they had to hurry out because they encountered something. They heard laughs and then walked into a room and there was no one there. Uh, a lot of times where they feel a presence and the, the hair on the back of their neck stands up. Many of the unexplained encounters center around Mr. Robertson, who still seems to oversee the day-to-day -day operations of his former residence. We had a family that had come through before saying that their daughter during a tour of the mansion just seemed to be off, looking off in the distance and laughing a lot. <laughs> but when they would ask her what she was giggling at, she was laughing so hard she couldn't explain herself. And it just kept happening room upon room that they would go through. And they finally said that after looking in the distance, she saw a man that was making faces at her that got her laughing throughout the tour of the mansion. And then finally they passed a portrait of Mr. Robertson and she said, that's the man that's been making the funny faces at me. Kids seem to have a sensitivity 
that goes beyond the kind of sensitivity that adults may show. And kids sometimes seem to know things that they shouldn't know. And there have been cases where kids have seemed to have some sort of communication with previous residents of the house. Does the spirit of Alonzo Robertson still linger in the halls of this elegant mansion that now brings so much joy to countless children? The Robertson Museum is open year-round, and brave visitors can explore this historic location on their own, or in groups. North of Wego, New York, you will find a narrow road snakes its way up the side of a steep hill and past the many marble monuments of Evergreen Cemetery. Located at the highest point in the cemetery, a stone obelisk towers over the historic village of Owego far below. This monument marks the final resting place of Sasana Loft, a Mohawk Indian maiden. She was a very enthusiastic and dedicated convert to Christianity, and she spread the gospel to people in this area. She came on the train, and there was a tragic train crash. She was killed. And the people of Owego were very saddened and touched by the loss. And so the people of Owego raised money to erect a beautiful obelisk in her memory. One thing that's interesting about that, though, is that Sasana's family did not really want her to stay in Owego. They wanted to bring her body home. But the people of Owego opposed that. They wanted to put up the obelisk and, and keep her there, and they succeeded. Visitors from far and wide still come to visit Sasana Loft's monument and to leave tokens at her graveside. However, Travelers of the living might not be the only ones who make the pilgrimage to pay their respects. It is said that shortly after her interment under the obelisk, visitors to Sasanalov's grave could hear the singing of Mohawk people in soft voices coming from the surrounding woods. Do the spirits of Sasanalov's ancestors still come to comfort the young maiden who died so far from home? Perhaps. If you find yourself in Evergreen Cemetery on a cool fall evening and listen closely, you might also hear the songs of the Mohawk carried on the breeze as it rustles through the nearby trees. For those who want to experience this historic cemetery for themselves, a printed walking tour guide is available at the Tioga County Historical Society Museum in Owego. Traveling west on Route 17C out of Owego, New York, the road rises sharply to crest a large hill. The steep road, bordered on one side by a rock cliff face and on the other by a drop straight down into the Susquehanna River, once had a treacherous curve referred to by locals as the Devil's Elbow. For over a century, the Devil's Elbow had been the site of a local legend, the story of a hitchhiking ghost known only as the Lady in White. So the this, this story usually goes that a young woman is standing by the edge of the road at Devil's Elbow, and she's planning a ride. She hopes to get a ride from a motorist. And when they would stop to look for her, she would disappear. It scared a few people, and some of the early motorists didn't like driving up on this, this stretch of road. People have collected vanishing hitchhiker stories in Europe, in Asia, they're told all over the world. However, unlike other hitchhiker ghost tales, the Devil's Elbow story may be grounded in real tragedy. In the 1800s, an inn and tavern stood at the bottom of this steep hill and was frequented by many unsavory individuals. In 1932, there was an excavation near the site of the tavern where the people discovered a skull of a young woman. She was killed with an ax or a board that fractured her skull. Interestingly, once this body was excavated and brought to the surface, we don't hear much about ghosts again. Was the lady in white the victim of a horrific murder? Did her restless soul finally find peace after her body was discovered a century later? Or does she still wander aimlessly along this stretch of road? 
Although the landscape has been altered and the road straightened, travelers who go searching for the answers along this section of highway might want to be wary of picking up any strangers along the way. This is just a quick reminder to subscribe. You'll be notified every time we upload new and fascinating content. If you enjoy this video, hit the like button. These are an immense help to our channel. In the heart of Binghamton, New York, the towering spires of a large Victorian mansion loom over the travelers on Court Street far below. Built in 1870 by Sherman D. Phelps, a prominent member of the local community, and designed by noted architect Isaac Perry, this imposing home was once considered the gem of Binghamton. Today, the mansion serves as a museum utilized by those who want to learn more about Victorian life and local history. We don't advertise ourselves as a ghostly house because we have a great deal of respect for those family members who died here. And I think our ghosts are rather quiet because we tell their story on the tours all the time. However, over the years, both visitors and staff have reported experiencing strange occurrences. There's the usual banging of doors, perhaps, on occasion, or doors flying open, or they should be open, they should be closed, whatever. I've never witnessed it myself, but we've been told that there's a clock on our mantel in the library that, although it is never, ever wound, will just suddenly start moving the hands. Many attribute these strange happenings to Sherman Phelps himself and believe his soul still watches over his beloved home. At holiday shops when we had that kind of event here, there are reports from that time when things would fly off the tables, purses would fly off the display. Another person said that he saw a gentleman in antique style clothing watching him. Maybe Sherman did not like us to have holiday shops cluttering up his house. Do the spirits of the Phelps family still haunt the halls of their former home? Or can these tales be explained away by less supernatural explanations? Curious visitors can explore this historic home for themselves, and the museum offers guided tours for courageous travelers throughout the year. Um, as we can tell from some of the episodes of Rod Serling's Twilight Zone and other movies, the use of a mirror is a very successfully used motif in horror stories and horror films. Mirrors traditionally were places where spirits might be willing to reveal themselves. And if you trace that back even earlier, you find that streams or lakes were thought to be places where spirits could appear. The Bloody Mary tradition, which is very well known in this country and also in Europe. The idea that if you repeat Mary's name several times in front of a mirror, she'll appear there. She has other names, Mary Worth, Mary Wolf, Scary Mary. She's well known in Europe. And this is an old tradition that if you speak just the right words, you may summon the spirit to come to you in the mirror. George Clark was the great-grandson of a colonial governor who has assembled a, an enormous property scattered around New York State. And in the 1790s, he decided to come and take up that inheritance. Uh, he came and uh, looked over his properties, fell in love with a woman who grew up in Cooperstown, who was the widow of a Cooper, actually. He married her. A couple of years later, they decided they were going to build a house in Albany, and then they switched their uh, intentions and moved to uh, Otsego Lake. They started off with a small cottage, and you can see that the original house looks relatively small, but even from the very beginning, they planned an extensive structure with its various parts that we see uh, today. It, it was really focused on the side of this hill for the view. The view is just extraordinary. My favorite part of the house is the extraordinary technology and designs that went into it. It has the first flush toilet from this area. It has a very early heating system. 
Uh, it has extraordinary lighting systems, all cutting edge in the 1820s. It's an incredible document that is so well preserved with very little change that it really offers us a picture of what life was like in the early 19th century. Rising high above Otsego Lake, just north of Cooperstown, New York, historic Hyde Hall has a commanding view of the countryside below. The neoclassic country mansion was the home of George Clark, a powerful and influential local landowner, and his wife, Anne Lowe Carey Cooper, widow of James Fenimore Cooper's brother, Richard. Stories of strange happenings and unexplainable events at Hyde Hall have been told for over a century. George Clark died in Hyde Hall in 1835. However, some claim that his spirit still roams the corridors of his majestic home. I think without question the most famous ghost story here is a story told by James Fenimore Cooper, not the noted author, but his less famous grandson. And he spent a night here and he was assigned a room on the second floor uh, back of the house. And in the middle of the night, he woke totally knowing that there was someone else in the room. And that knowledge was reinforced by the sound of footsteps coming from a corner of the room. And the footsteps grew louder and closer and eventually stopped at the foot of the bed. And then the covers were pulled from the bed. The next day, when he reported the incident to his hostess, she, she confessed that she had assigned him the haunted room, old George Clark's dressing room. And she said that her own daughter and a maid had seen an old man going down the hall and disappearing into that room. Does George Clark still refuse to leave the home he loved so much? Or are there more reasonable explanations for the strange happenings at Hyde Hall? Travelers can decide for themselves. Hyde Hall is open to visitors year-round, and the museum offers special candlelit evening tours in October for visitors who are more interested in exploring the supernatural happenings at the mansion. Some of the best stories come from residence halls because that's where the students sleep, where they socialize, spend their time, get to know their friends. A couple of my students talked about bringing a Ouija board into a room and asking questions to see if there were any spirits there and not getting any good answers to the questions, feeling very frustrated. But then afterwards, happening to look at the window pane and seeing that there were handprints of tiny, tiny little hands left on the outside of the glass. That creeped them out considerably, the idea that there might have been little ghosts trying to get through the window at them while they were using the Ouija board. And often students worry about Ouija boards, fearing that it might bring them some sort of evil presence to use a board like that. Even though it's a, it's a game that people can buy in a toy store, so there's that fear. One fascinating aspect of ghost stories is that they're constantly adapting to the environment and they become part of events that happen. They get intertwined with recent news. And for example, there was a fire in Owego at the Hand of Man store. And not too long after that, two residents of Owego who were taking my folklore class told me they had heard people in Owego say that if you looked up at Evergreen Cemetery, you could see that there was a direct line from the obelisk down to the store that burned. So the implication there seemed to be that there was anger from this deceased Indian woman, that there was burning that came from her grave. I thought that was very interesting. I haven't heard that story told more recently. I think memories of that fire is starting to fade some, but people are still very interested in her grave. It appears to go back to ancient Greece, 
when people believed that if you wanted to cross from the realm of the living to the realm of the dead with Charon, the ferryman, you needed to present a coin to make your passage. And so coins are thought to be part of the passage from life to death. And we could also see them as a kind of tribute to those who have died in a way to facilitate their smooth transition. The last time I went there, I noticed that there were several coins from other countries and I left a coin from Denmark because I'd just gone to a legend meeting there just to give my own tribute to her. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, comment, and share to keep fascinating content coming here at Nightmare Nexus.